Hey folks, it's Jeremy Kirkland and you're listening to Blamo. How you doing? If you're new here, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Is that is uh are we all good? We all good this week? We're hitting spring. We're hitting full spring. I think the first official day of spring is this coming week. Uh if you're listening to this as as a new episode. Here we go, you know, you got your new gear, you're feeling good. Probably got some tunes going. Uh and you're probably if you're smart cuz you're all smarties. Probably going to be listening to my guest this week, the Lemon Twigs. Uh, I have to say, this episode had me l- just like I could barely maintain composure trying to interview these two dudes. They're they're the singer songwriter virtuoso brothers who are also I would argue probably some of the most stylish folks in music. It's funny because um, as you'll listen to the pod, they kind of I mean they banter like crazy. They cut each other off. I mean, it's a great interview, but like one of them usually joins me to interview the other person at the time. I mean, it's 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 just really good. Uh, Brian and Michael Daddario, they're just nonstop on this pod. Uh, but just hearing their thought process on everything was just honestly really, really refreshing. I've loved these guys for years and was so, so pleased to have them on the show. We chat songwriting, clothes, analog recording, their Jimmy Fallon appearance, which uh, was pretty nuts. Tim Heidecker's Office Hours, the best videos on YouTube, Art Garfunkel, Elton John phone calls, and their new album, A Dream Is All We Know. Let's dig in. So how, how are you guys doing, man? What's happening? We're good. We're, we were just working on a music video yesterday and the day before, or the two days before. Yeah, the last three days, something like that. Yeah. The first two videos we did were like pretty easy because Ambar and Navarro and Max Blick, they like worked on the There's videos. There's people together. who directed, well, directed and DP of the yeah. video. We just did for this record. And then they did one on the last record too. But Yeah. So we like just walked onto those shoots basically and we only ever ha- would have to say one or two things what they if they had you know one in our opinion or on yeah. anything or anything like that but we don't really do much when it comes to that so the creative was set and you just guys you just walked on just grabbed grabbed guitars and went which you know it, like usually what we because on the last record we started doing our own videos more and kind of maybe even before that but um yeah directly yeah them. she's probably like one of very few people that we would trust to just take care of the whole thing yeah yeah so but this last video we're we're doing it ourselves and michael work. especially is like doing you know all the like and, you know shot lists and everything like that and that's this and our friend paul is who worked on a couple of our other videos is like uh dping and yeah, stuff. yeah it's all so on it's, film so we just it, you know it's like writing writing out all uh, yeah it's not that hard it's it's not like crazy or anything like that it's just kind of like uh busy work that's annoying like not even doing time you know just dragging the thing to the thing and writing out okay this is gonna happen there this is gonna happen there this is gonna we're gonna get coverage of the full thing we're gonna get just close shots there you know all that kind of stuff just to make sure every line is covered and all that and because we're not just yeah. gonna do full performance of of the song and then cut it together you know yeah i mean it's interesting how music videos have evolved right let's jump on your record because it's really really good and like i i first got into you guys when you were on 480 yeah. and this new record i mean correct me if i'm wrong about how this stuff was recorded so this new one, sonically, you did everything on tape in the room, like Glenn John style, whatever. Well, we, we the last record, every record we've done has been on tape. It's just a, a matter of uh, whether or not we mixed it analog or digital. So the first mm-hmm. one mixed digital, but I think one of the tracks was an analog mix that was a rough mix. And then um, second one was all analog mixing, but we were really learning at that point how to do it. So it's really kind of rough. And the analog mixing was probably not the best move at that point. And then uh, the third one is digital digital mixing, but, but so much, I mean, all the stuff is initially recorded tape. And then whether or not it stays on tape is maybe a matter of if we need to do overdubs or if the mixing yeah. is just complicated or whatever. So with that third one, it was, there was so much analog stuff done, so much reprocessing and stuff. But it, but in the end, it was all these tracks and you had to mix it digital because you had to make sense of it. And then with uh, the one before this new one, it was digital right. mixing. Yeah. We just had so many tracks, so many, so many orchestrations. Yeah. It was not feasible to get them, punch them in on tape. You know, we had to record this. But then this new one, it, because we weren't 
going to do tons and tons of overdubs and it was just going to be the two of us, which it pretty much was just the two of us in a room going back and forth, overdubbing and overdubbing. Um, we could, with the exception of a few songs on tape. Yeah. We were able to mix it tracks down and, uh, it was fairly simple. Most of the mixing, you know, that's always the preference is to be able to do really do it. Because there were, uh, with the last album, you obviously, it's like a cliche, you know, you have so many options digitally that you end up doing 30 mixes, you know, of one song, you know, and they're just all slightly different, you know? Mm-hmm. Again, yeah, the standards change drastically. You know, that being said, like if we were, when we mixed that album, nothing was shifted nothing was you know the the concept like it, it was really just like if if we had endless uh funds to record a record we would do it all the way did you, but it's like you know what i'm saying i mean, we'd do it all the way in no yeah it's, it's just kind of a matter of like okay this is like practical practical yeah yeah like you ever get in your head with that stuff so like so i grew up in a recording studio my dad used to make a bunch of records and stuff and everything was tape it was like a giant otari 16 track and he was just getting some of the digital stuff um his health got rough and so like you know and so he started to use pro tools a bit but he would always jump back to analog and you know he would always talk about like the warmth of that and like brian wilson talks about in interviews and stuff too where he couldn't he couldn't even tell the difference anymore and it was but it was more just like like almost psychological like in your head like you felt like if it was going to tape, you could get a better performance out of you. Like, has that ever happened with you guys into which you feel like, okay, we're actually, this isn't red light syndrome. We're, we're recording, we're putting this on tape. Like, like let's nail this. Or how does that feel? Yeah. I mean, I think that comes into play. I think like more than anything is it's really um, like uh, in the sense of it, it might be easier to mix digitally for some things. It's all about practicality. So it's like mm-hmm. I more, I can do digital quicker than I can do. I mean, I can do, tape quicker than I can do digital. Mm. I'm more familiar with it. You know, Brian can be playing and overdubbing instruments and I'll be able to engineer him quickly and and uh, get, maybe you have the idea of like somebody can do a full performance because it's not as easy to comp. It's not as easy to put things together. Um, but really for me, it's just all about what the quicker and easier way to get a good sound. And it's easier and quicker to get a good sound on tape. Yeah. You have to manipulate the stuff to get the computer to sound good. You yeah. Know, you have to, a lot of, <laughs> Yeah, you have to do a lot of stuff that it it's just always puzzling to me when somebody's opinion is the opposite about how difficult it is. Makes sense for certain kinds of music that are edit based and right. that are based on writing on the computer. We put down the rhythm track and then we try to improvise over it. Makes mm. sense to do it that way, but it doesn't make sense when you write a song and, and you know what the arrangement is going to be, especially the lyrics and stuff. Yeah. It's like if you know, it, it's also difficult. If you're spitballing to, lyrics over tape, that might be kind of annoying because yeah. you can't <laughs> just take one piece and put it, you know. Yeah. It's really nice to know too um, when you're putting a vocal together. Okay, do I really like this vocal? Because if I don't like this vocal, or if I kind of like this vocal, I'm I'm about to record over it and it's about to be gone. You know. Yeah. yeah. That's it with decision making for sure yeah i mean that's got to mess with some of the like rawness of it right i mean you know because like there there's stuff on your record and i mean this in a in a loving way like there's tiny little imperfections but i think it sounds good it sounds real it sounds like a real record versus some things i don't know like say max martin or whatever where it's like everything is pitch corrected everything is you know air quoting correct in sync quantized and this like there's just energy i mean it's it's really really good it's it's fun i listen to it a lot that's great you. you know to me it's like if i'm working on the computer and i gotta do uh and i like you become obsessed with uh i should really be doing it to the grid you know because i have the <laughs> yeah 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 and so i should do it to the grid and mm-hmm. then it's, i should really be you know or you have a take that might be more raw really and you keep decide that you have all these you have eight options and one of them you're like i like my scream on that oh i like my thing on that what's nice uh, about uh the tape is you don't really get to uh consider those kinds of things it's like and if you have an imperfection it might be because you did one all the way through and if you punch over that one part it ruins the whole thing you're gonna hear punch it's gonna fuck it up so then you end up leaving in just a little thing not like i don't know you don't have to ch- if you choose to put in an imperfection it feels so phony <laughs> let's try this again and and uh get pitchy on this uh on this chorus here <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i hear you there's there's stuff like that too especially when people really want to emulate certain records yeah you know where 
Like they're like, oh, we're not going to, you know, run this mic through this. We're going to actually record to a PA and then we're going to mic the PA and then we're going to run that through, you know, some sort of weird compressor and crap to like get your thing. I mean, there's different tricks. I get it. But um, regardless, I mean, you guys, you guys did a great record. Um, What's in, in terms of like how both of you have been writing? I mean, you're you're both, I'd I'd argue, like basically virtuosos, like in the fact that you can play every instrument and all this stuff like how is the um how is like the songwriting going between both of you in in terms of like does someone like no this is my song it's happening this way or is it much more collaborative we tend to agree on um you know say if like a lyric is bad or whatever it's like it, it is we don't really write together very often but um we ch- we check each other i think you know if a chord's mm-hmm. This is like, you know, generic or whatever. We'll tell each other, you know. Um, but usually we kind of have an inclination on, you know, on that kind of thing beforehand, you know. Yeah. I'm mean, pretty in sync when it comes to those uh, critiques. Um, but yeah, we don't really write together. Very yeah, often. we just record together and we record, you know, sometimes things are slightly unfinished before you get them uh, on record or something. So, you know, uh I got everything figured out except for this little bit right here or whatever. And so I'll be on the drums and Brian will be on the instrument that he wrote on Mm -hmm. and kind of figure out the structure more rock solid. Yeah. I mean, that's like how you would do it in a band, I guess. It's just, it's just, it's really, it's just with with just the two of us instead. And then we do it vice versa the same way. Brian will be on the drums and I'll be on a rhythm instrument. We mostly um, help with the arrangements of each mm, other. Yeah. We arrange it. And then, um, but we take certain roles like Michael is like the engineer uh, responsible for the sound of the records mm-hmm. and then like the arranger ish uh, for like the orchestrations. Um, and, and we collaborate on the harmony. Yeah. Typically, yeah. You know. Yeah. But um, then also we, you know, if it gets into the digital realm, there's a pretty clear, uh, uh, I don't know, we have roles and I don't really think we, either of us are that bothered by them, but like, the, I think like, if it's digital though digital? no yeah if it's digital uh brian oh, usually mix. like brian was more the mixer for the last record he really mixed it i didn't really mm. mix it before it was probably one. more of the mixer for, for this, this one yeah this because, yeah, because it was analog and stuff but i you know i don't I think you mixed a whole song without me too yeah probably yeah it just but you know but like it's so you know, it'd be don't. like can you do just can you just handle the vocals and i'll handle yeah. the instruments here and i'll bring this in often with the analog mixing is that way you need more than one person to do it and we do really have this thing of like um even if i play all the instruments on a song it doesn't really feel like i'm responsible for the whole song even if it's my song and i played all the instruments for a song well you can imagine if if you're if your brain is so overwhelmed by playing all the instruments on a song and you're picking up literally the way he will do it a lot of times is picking up every instrument doing the bass doing the bass kind of just playing and not really thinking about it as much Mm -hmm. and i'll do do that bit switch that around and it's kind of like a machine you know and um if 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 Brian can really be totally fluid, the way to get him to be totally fluid is by paying attention really hard and just and because no, there aren't really engineers like that at this point. Because no engineer is invested that invested in what. Yeah, well, maybe maybe in our world, every yeah, it seems like <laughs> it seems like every musician I've ever met is only but fo- really focused on their project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah. If, they, even <laughs> if they're helpful, even even if you need to get someone on your recording really nowadays like, everybody's got yeah everybody's yeah, yeah, got yeah. their own thing so everybody that's what's good about and everybody's so underpaid too it's like you know yeah. you it's not even like a monetary like uh you know incentive yeah to exactly. get someone to really i, th- I think that play would, well on your your thing that would yeah. probably be even though we have been lucky with like people playing well on our things but it's like you you do have to you know pay attention pay more attention and kind of because twist, I, twist their arm to me yeah. i'm I'm getting so much out of it by trying to get his thing to be as good as possible because it's got my name on it too, you know? You know, I mean, for me, like the mental scenario of how people are recording, like what goes on in people's heads to make that happen? What are the compromises that have to take place? I mean, because like you're talking to someone too, at least for me, I listen to, you know, I'll listen to stuff in the car, you know, but I, I don't really like passively listen to music that much anymore. Yeah. It's more of like sit down, put it on, start to finish, you know, no distractions, don't have your phone out, don't start researching stuff, just 
sit and like experience it, you know? I mean, it's like, I have a nice set of speakers at home. You know, I get a little bit nuts on, on like the quality of audio. Like I'm, I'm not listening to this, like AAC stuff, whatever, like it's gotta be, it's gotta be the best. And so like, you know, especially too, as someone who, I mean, how something is made is almost more important than how something is performed. You know, I mean, like, I'm sure you got, you all have dug into, you know, Dylan records and stuff that have been recorded or things that go like three, four times, you know, different s- studios, scenarios, start to finish. I mean, that, that stuff to me just really, really like gets me the most amped. Yeah. Yeah. It does help. It helps when you know, this is kind of the same idea as, as uh, Oh, that engineer engineered that record too. I got to check that record out, you know? Yeah. It's right. Just, it gives you some kind of like thing to think about while you're listening to the music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, that being said, like, were there specific records or people on the other side, you know, people on the other side of the of the board that really inspired you or, or well, made you try to emulate certain sounds? This band Tagus uh, is a Swedish band that have, have a record from 1967 called Studio. And it's like, it's this post, I think it's like, must be right after Sgt. Pepper or like, even slightly mm. before, but um but definitely it's gotta be no it's way gotta it's be be before it. but it's the same year you know so yeah it's, but it's like one of these post sergeant pepper uh psychedelic uh masterpiece records you know but it was one that we hadn't ever heard before so whenever before like you know a few years ago you now it's gotta be sure it's it, so inspiring when you hear something like that because it's like you know you, it makes you feel like you can make one too you know because yeah. it's like you've gone your whole life not hearing it and uh well, we, I don't know if we were striving necessarily to make one of those records because this record is kind of a, um, a bit of a, like we, we pulled things like we pulled one song that was supposed to be on the last record. And then we pulled one song that was quite a bit older too, but certainly sonically, like, um, a lot of compression and stuff. I, and, and we, uh, a lot of the same instrumentation and yeah, it's also super ambitious arrangements um and uh but pop writing that you can understand the first time you hear it you know yeah i mean it's 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 super catchy it's good like i remember do you remember that band rocking horse i'm sure people yeah. like it yeah i think like biggest gossip in town or um yes it is i think they were like a light in the attic band. Yeah. but you know when you listen to records of that era it's funny because you had mentioned compression, right? Like there wasn't a ton of compression on these things. You know, it would only sound like that when you would hear like a radio cut because it would just be like smashed to shit so they could boost it up. And the the amount of like sonic space on your guys' recordings. I mean, it's uh, it's great. Like that's why what the If You and I Are Not Wise, like that track, like it, I don't know. It's almost like I can hear the room and I, I might even just be making that up. And you're like, dude, I did it in the closet. Chill. Like, but I mean, uh, it's, it's good. I think there. I think I think on those records. I don't know if there. I, well, I think on Rock and Horse. I don't know if there's tons of compression. But on this Tagus record, there's definitely a lot. But I think that the compression isn't. Um, it's not on. It's not like bus. Comp- it's not like on the whole track. Yeah. Track. It's it's like yeah. on individual tracks, and then certain ones are fused together. Like uh, I mean, on a lot of Beatle records, it'll be drums and something else, and they'll put those together. And every time they do it, they put it through a compressor. Well, a lot of those consoles even had compressors on each channel strip. Mm-hmm. But there is still space because I think that everything in and of itself isn't being compressed together. There's certain records, of course, that are. <laughs> but th- that's the modern uh, thing is everything squashed together at the end, yeah. which not really the way to me. It's like the sound is busting things together, squashing them or not really squashing, but, you know, compressing them and putting them on one track. And there's a lot of what we did on this record a lot was um, fully left, fully right. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of the kind of panning all the strings on the left, all the trumpets on the right or something. And that creates space. space. You know? Yeah. So on the close, cause I got to talk about this stuff too. Um, I think you guys it, explain to me some of your guys's like clothes and style here, because the, you're very much, I don't know if it's subscribed a hundred percent, like, to the to the fit but like every time i've seen you in different eras even seeing you guys play live your style is like incredible where where did this come from and like the vintage and the i don't know walk me through this in high school i got really into wearing like paisley shirts and you know stuff like that 
because I was obsessed with like early Pink Floyd. Um, okay. And, you know, I would get my hair cut like Roger Waters or something, you know, show yeah. a picture of him to my uh, friend who would cut my hair. Um, yeah, I guess the, like, we, yeah, we just started dressing, we started shopping uh, in vintage stores and stuff like that in high school. And I don't know, really, I, I, I can't say, I, I always felt like, you know, you do like maybe seeing the Foxygen and stuff. They thought they were like, thought that Sam was like, uh, mm-hmm. just, just do a dress like, whoever like whoever he liked you know and didn't have like a like a barrier against doing that like like oh i can you know make records that sound like this but i don't want to like look like that that would be corny you know i (laughs) I think i i heard i like definitely heard people say very similar things to that yeah but i just kind of thought you just do whatever you want so i think i always think it now i've settled into what i was into in high school really was things that were neat and went together because i kind of felt like i had like a little bit of that i didn't want to say like everybody says like i had a little ocd but i always felt like i really liked things to be neat and stuff and trying to like put things together in a loose way like keith Richard, like somebody who's like that like who's really that, that was very difficult for me but i try, had tried to do that at points but now i kind of like like neat like having a neat it just comes easier more naturally to me wait wait, wait, wait a second i gotta get my bids in on the bezel app but more on that in, in a minute i get all sorts of emails and questions from you all which i love to read and respond And one thing I constantly get and even read in the Blamo Slack is what watch should I buy and where should I get it? It's a wild world out there with all sorts of websites and shops, but I go to Bezel. Bezel is the trusted marketplace for buying and selling your next luxury watch with expert in-house authentication on every purchase. First off, folks, it's getbezel.com. That's getbezel.com. But I use and recommend Bezel because it's the best of both worlds. You can go to the site and browse a marketplace of luxury watches, over 16,000 of them, by the way, which is a lot. And I know that Bezel is going to authenticate your purchase. Or you can create an account and get connected with your own private client advisor called the concierge. Because look, making a watch purchase can be confusing, especially when you don't know all the reference numbers. When was this made? Did they use ceramic then? Is it a triple lop, dingle top? You know, what the heck? I don't even know. But they do at Bezel, and they're here to help. Concierge, baby. Look, if looking for your watch to mark a special occasion, or maybe you're just doing research, right? They even have their own journal where you can learn all the ins and outs about Bezel and the brands and all the stuff that's happening right now. But back to my bids. Yes, Bezel now has auctions, and not just any auctions. They got Rolex, they got Cartier, they got Audemars Piguet, all the big dogs, and more. So you can discover, bid, and know the Bezel team has got your back with verified in-house authentication. So visit getbezel.com on your smartphone or computer, Bezel, the trusted marketplace for buying or selling your next luxury watch. Yeah, I mean, are there like, do you only shop vintage or? Yeah, I mean, I, people get, I've been given things before and that, that aren't vintage or I'll, you know, buy new underwear. Uh, well, I figured that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some people don't, you know, I don't, I I don't care. I mean, it could be anything, but I like that stuff, but I like everything. Like I like when things feel nice and when things um, like nice furniture, I don't really have, but I like that stuff. Nice lamps, nice guitars. I'm a material person. I like (laughs) compressors and stuff like that. (laughs) So it just extends to that, you know, it's all, but it's all, all that stuff's a very specific era. I mean, you have kind of like, you know, late 60s, early to mid 70s. Um, yeah. I mean, that's it's kind of a golden era in terms of the advantages of industrial manufacturing, but not like watered down, diluted crap. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, you have like at least from a clothing standpoint, the only thing that happened in the 70s on clothing that they didn't do as much as is polyester. And now most of that stuff is in is an athletic gear. But like, you know, my dad had a, um, a Nutter suit. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know if you guys know Nutter. Know. So Tommy Nutter and Edward Sexton invented and created the, I mean, when you look at suits of Elton John, uh, Rolling Stones, uh, Mick Jagger suit when he married Bianca Jagger, like that, that was all um, Nutter's. And Nutter's was like one of the first Savile Row spots that oh. made like that style suit, which is like, think strong shoulders, 
you know, lower gorge. So that's like where the collar meets the lapel is like much lower on the chest. You know, that that kind of like classic stuff. When If you look at like a Gucci ad right now and you're seeing, you know, Jared Leto wear a Gucci, that's like a nutter suit. And a lot of that stuff had like poly blends and stuff into it. But like it, even now, and I think because of like this era of like eBay and Depop and then vintage stores, like it's hard to find that stuff. So, I mean, do you guys just like, you know, just get whatever you can when you're on the road? Like, do you like set aside time, time to shop or is it just like, no, man, this is an afterthought? Well, they don't say we don't set aside time. There's only this nothing but time to do that kind of like a, the, you, we, we go shopping a lot on the road uh, in between soundcheck and uh, the show. Okay. That, that's really all there is to do. And then, uh, or eat. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we just we do, do when we have, uh, have time. Yeah. Um, I try, I try to go shopping, uh, in town here when, um, when there's, if there's like a video coming up or something, I just, I find that, uh, we don't have the best in New York, the best, uh, vintage clothes. I don't yeah, think you're right. I mean, like, so I used to live there for a long time and then I commute there and vintage is good. But the thing is like vintage, right? Like, in your head, if I said vintage, what year do you think? Like 60s, 70s, I think. Right. Which which is what I think is correct. But now vintage is just 20 years ago. So technically vintage is 2004. Yeah. There's nothing in 2004 in my head that's vintage. Like it's just so like with that in mind, it's just harder to find good stuff. Or it's like, cool. Do you want this 1930s frock coat? It's like, yeah. no, fam. Like, you know. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of uh, a lot of like '90s Y2K like stuff here for sure. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Here. It has been for a, like a long time here. It's been big for like a, a super long time. What seems like a long time here. I feel like you mean like like the Dime Square aesthetic, like the yeah. yeah the silver tab jeans and the you know oversized shirts and stuff like that. Like I get it, I respect it. It's cool, but um, I don't know. It's no lemon twigs. Just saying. Well, I don't. It's just not. It's, I don't know. We, I think that they're just dressing like they're heroes, right? And that's what uh, I, I just like, um, you know, music from that era. And I was, I don't know, fun, just fun. And the stuff is nice. You know, this is a nice. That's a hang ten shirt, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not nice as good. Yeah, it looks it looks sick as fuck. What, what, what about your uh, your your shirt collar there? You got the super super long pointed collar. This isn't vintage. See, I wear so much stuff of my girlfriend, Anastasia, and she she gets mad at me sometimes. But also she lets me wear it and gets me a lot of stuff. I have a little bit more of this a used to be my shirt. passive <laughs> relationship to the whole thing. And Michael gets me a lot of stuff. And yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I go with him a lot. And so I, I pick up the odd thing. But I also don't, you know, get sick of my clothes as, as quickly as, uh, as Michael does. So I have stuff that I've gotten that I got like, you know, close to 10 years ago that I still I have wear. stuff that I've gotten a long time ago. Like, I think you just, as you go, you kind of, uh, but what hair down, deal? what, what it is that you really, really do like. And what stuff. is the deal with the, the shirts? Sweater. Oh, no, the, sweater? the shirt is not. Vintage. The shirt is vintage. Yeah. But the sweater you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> that's the whole, that's the scoop. <laughs> it it were hype. It was always really weird though, because when we first, when our first album came out, we would do a lot of uh, fashion magazines and stuff. It was always embarrassing. And people was horrible. And the whole <laughs> photo shoot, we would the, the people there would be trying to convince us to to oh, wear shit. wear all of the stuff that was like just completely not our style at all. You know. Oh. Like, remember this guy was wearing like this super oh oversized <laughs> shirt, like it ends oversized pants. Like, you know, like it was like 20 the, times to be, you know, it was like bigger, not, than a, a, not like a, not like a nineties fit or something. It was like it was the like, David Byrne thing kind of like that. Yeah. But it wasn't like, like, cool. It was like baggy. Like it was super, it was ridiculous, but it was super fashiony. And, and he pulled it, out this gigantic shirt. They said, you guys should wear like this. Exactly the same proportions to us as like what he was wearing. He yeah, was yeah. like, there's something about this. I think that I like. Yeah. We were like, I just don't think I like that. Like fit. He was like, I think like super, super tiny. <laughs> Good he accent. Super huge. Like, I don't know. I think he might have been Australian or some shit. They're always like Australian or like Irish or something. He was going to be like, well, or some shit. I don't know. Northern. I don't know. They, it, you're like super huge and or like super tiny. I'm like, what about like the right size? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah, man, that's the fashion world's weird, man. It's, it's and the, the funny thing is like at the end of the day, a lot of fashion is like trying to get someone to look like themselves. And so when you look at these shoots and stuff, especially for it's a shoot of a personality. So like someone like yourself or some 
celebrity or whatever. It's like, no, no, no. Like the, I'm the draw. Like that's, that's the point. So me, what me looking like me is, is what you want versus me cosplaying as, you know, a Sith Lord. That's just, that's yeah. not going to fly. <laughs> you can always tell, you can always tell when somebody's <laughs> a number of things that they're clearly uncomfortable in. Well, I'm sure the, the summer tour or whatever. Like yeah. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot. When Diff- we didn't different era, power. different time. I mean, cause you guys have been, how long have you been playing music? Like actively as Lemon Twigs. Oh, as a Lemon Twigs since we were since I was fourteen. I was okay, uh, fifteen or sixteen or whatever was yeah. when we started. Two thousand and fifteen, some headway. But two thousand fifteen in the is, industry. Okay, but when we was, were at the Lemon Twigs, that yeah. was two thousand and fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. Okay, so you got a decade under your belt. So yeah, you got you got different eras. I mean, you think about the Beatles and everyone else. Like you're 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 moving out of those other eras, and now 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 you're hitting your prime, right? We're about to break up. We're at the White Album. Now, you know what we we should we, we don't we don't have to we can start it when i was you know george's age or whatever we don't get we don't have to start it like we don't 14. have to start the clock it's like at 14 no that's not, <laughs> i mean you have to you know that's there has not to be fair. some sort of like interest that builds up as the, the human lifespan to get like older or whatever like you know maybe we maybe we started like oh. when we were like you know oh. I mean, no, that would be As great. To 20. I always try to tell myself that, you know, well, you know, whoever it is that I'm thinking about currently, like they didn't start until they were like, my age right now. So I, none of that stuff counts, but it doesn't work with the Beatles because they were, when I was about to turn were, 25 yeah. and I realized that I hadn't done my pet sounds yet, that was a, that was a difficult, I'm about to turn 25 birthday. and, yeah. and I don't feel that you've done your pet sounds. Well, I'm, so you I'm haven't not, done your pet sounds. End of interview. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. No, I, mean, I think it's interesting that you like you think that way. And I feel like that that's like a human thing, right? Where we're constantly measuring our success and achievements against the people that we admire. But like, let's if you want to zoom way out here, you mentioned Brian Wilson, right? Brian uh-huh. Wilson, sadly, unfortunately, just lost his, his partner, his wife. And now there's a conservative ship that's going to be put over him. The dude peaked. It doesn't mean he's not a good artist. It doesn't mean his work didn't matter. But like, imagine if you peak at the age you are now, like that sucks. Like your whole, I mean, aging and, you know, and getting and improving and learning and stuff like it's, it's always going to happen. And so like, I think it couldn't also be a curse. You know, if you think, okay, shit, you did your pet sounds two years ago. All right. Well, game over. You can collect a check, but like, what are you going to do? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, that's just a, you know, that's something that you, you end up thinking about, you know, in your, in your darkest moments or whatever, but uh, it's not something that if you're, if you're constantly making music, you know, that's not something that factors into your thinking a lot, you know, and all, obviously we don't care about, you know, it being something that's appreciated or like something that is like known by other people as like a classic album or whatever. It's just, we just want to be able to make records that we feel like yeah, we I'm li- fully satisfied. Yeah. We listen to it all the way through and we go, that's incredible. I think it takes, it, it did take uh, longer for us to start to get records like that. Like I think our, we feel that way about our last record and our new record. But I think a lot of that may have to do with having um, disparate interests. And like we, we were completely also not only focused on writing, but also focused on learning engineering, also focused right. on learning engineering, doing live shows, trying to pay attention to, to the business a little bit to not get screwed. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like there's so many f- factors that that you think about when you're not at Abbey road with a endless amount of money, able to just record for hours and hours and hours. It's like, you got to figure out how to get it perfect in this amount of time. Do you know what I mean? Not yeah. just, yeah. So it's kind of like, it, 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 I don't know. It's just a diff, totally different development than, than like the development. So, but but also, that's what, that's what's so amazing about people like Emmett Rhodes and people who, who do it themselves. And yeah, I don't know, just somebody who's able to crystallize something so well without the resources of a of like one of these huge 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 bands you know i mean that's it's true i think like if you when you have the machine behind you 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 know it it can be a little bit difficult to focus and and have your own sort of pure artistic intent because if you have you know and when i mean like the machine i mean like a full sort of squad or like super label industrial complex or whatever that's behind you and it's like oh we have this this strategy and this and because we have an advance of this we have to spend this much on the record and and that means we got to hire this super producer and it's like what the hell like it, it removes it removes some of the art that made you all you know good to begin with um 
And I think like that's the fine line as any musician matures into which like I root for all of them. But sometimes we're like, whoa, there's just too much like business in this. <laughs> like it just feels, yeah. I just think that some that if, if you could really do whatever you want, like if we could get an orchestra to play, you know what I mean? If like mm-hmm. if we were able to do that, then it's just different from recording your own strings and stuff like that or getting the odd string player or whatever. It's just different to to be able to go into a real studio with seven engineers or whatever. And just yeah. uh, you can kind of get what's in your mind out or better with like none of this um, figuring out how do we do it? How do we, you know, it's like that part of it can be kind of stifling, but for really time, ambitious stuff. It can know? be stifling, but then also it can um, create something new. Create cool. something, yeah, yeah. Like in the case of, I guess, Roy Wood or something. No, that's not what he wanted to do. He just was doing that. That was his vision to it himself. You know, get to. Yeah, you say like I just spent money to hire a string quartet, and that was I spent too much money. So now I'm going to do an album playing all the strings. Say hypothetically, <laughs> uh, I'm going to do all the strings. That's creative. That's creativity at work. That's a good. That's a good well you're pulling from. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, when do you guys start your tour? We're we're gonna start rehearsing like next month when our drummer uh who lives in LA, but he's gonna be staying in New York for like two months before mm-hmm. the tour. Yeah, we're nice. gonna be a first a ton. It's it's gonna be super fun. Is this the same crew from the Fallon? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. The the, yeah. uh, Sonic, I mean, you guys played so incredibly tight. Like, and and I'll say this as a person who's seen a lot of bands on Fallon and live and in, in person. It's hard to sound good in there. Yeah. It's uh-huh. really hard to sound good. Um, it's, you know, there's, it's almost like a TV curse where it's like almost every band sounds bad on SNL and stuff, but like, it, it's hard to sound good. And you guys sounded really, really tight. Like the mix, I don't, did you listen back to the, did you watch the video and hear the mix? I mean, it's great. Oh yeah, it's uh, only 300 times. <laughs> Michael's finest moment, really. Yeah, it's so <laughs> certain. I prepared a lot to try to make sure nothing would go wrong. The fact that we weren't doing a tour at the same oh, time yeah. was like so helpful because what happens to us obviously it and happens to Well, it's a catch twenty two. Our voices get kind of worn out, you know, after yeah. a tour and stuff. So we were worried because we weren't on a tour recently that we wouldn't be super tight. Mm-hmm. But we then we knew that, that also the the voice thing was was a factor. It's like if you can get for us, if you can get like two or three days before where you haven't sung at all, it's like your voice or my voice personally can be so much better than just if I just sang the day before. Mm. It's just it's a huge troll. But yeah, I was Sen- I have a sense of sensitive voice, I think. Yeah. I I smashed my hand through a oh, glass yeah, that's right. a glass five minute uh, five, five minutes, minutes before, before we, we went on. Because I was practicing. I wanted to pr- practice my windmill. I wanted to I wanted to know exactly where I was gonna do it, which not very rock and roll. Um <laughs> That's so, good. It, but, but, so, so we were in the tiny dressing room and there was like oh, a glass right. a glass. Well, case I just wanted and, to say that we were oh. in the tiny dressing room because we had some friends with us and we had uh and then the label and uh publicity were there. So the, the whole big dressing room was Filled with filled them. with people. So, oh so my just, god. In this little room. little room with the there's floor. a glass casing hanging on the wall, and I and I did my last window, and I put a lot of emphasis on it, and I, I yeah, I, my hand was oh bleeding. My I, I had to go to the nurse; she had to patch me up, and uh, yeah, but I, she did a real <laughs> well. Blood was not pouring down my my hand or anything. I mean, uh, you didn't notice it on the performance, but yeah, I was sh- you know I was like shaking. Yeah, he was shaking up just, because of that. You know? It's just like I, I just didn't know if I was if I was going to be affected by that or whatever. Oh yeah, I'm proud to say that humbly, uh, I was the glue. Mm. I was the guy who was get you know rallying the troops. Humbly, I just want to say that humbly. That's very humble of you. <laughs> but the, 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 I, I mean, uh, uh, I think we just made sure the guitars weren't too distorted. Anyway, I think that's enough on that. Oh, no, but I've, how, how we sound good. The drums, there's so many factors just on why. Just take the compliment. No, but seriously, there's a lot of factors. <laughs> well, one thing would be that we were lip syncing and then it was a track. Yeah, that helped. There you go. Yeah, there you that's go. You, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Yeah, imagine you have your Ashley Simpson moment, you know, and you just do a hunky dory oh, yeah. dance on the on the stage. One night I was what was it like that? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was like a jig. I felt bad. Like my friends and I, we were we were hanging out. I think one of us was stoned or something. It might have even been all of us or me. And we were like, yo, you remember 
Ashley Simpson on SNL. And he was like, no, what are you talking about? And he pulled up his phone, he showed it. And I was like, oh my God. Cause they left it. Like they left the camera on like just on her. And yeah. then, then the, then the band was just like, well, fuck it. Here we go. And they just tear into the chorus and they, and they're like zooming in on the musicians, like, like going into the chorus. And then they eventually just like cut. <laughs> I was like, oh man, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Well, at least you guys don't have to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the yeah, worst yeah. we can do is just break a string and sound horrible the whole time. Resident did break a stick. solid man. He broke a stick at the end there, but he got lucky that it was at the end. I don't know how you guys play on on gear so old and yeah. manage to make it work. You know, so my dad had a a, a Moog and a, and a Rhodes and all this stuff. He had an Opus Three, a Mini Moog, and all that. And um, he he said they were the worst things to tour with ever because. Mm-hmm. Phones, at the, this is in the 80s and 90s and like when cell phones started to come in. So this is before, I don't know what megahertz it was. Like they would have to wrap the inside of the roads in foil to try to protect it because they would be playing and it would just cut out. There would be all these issues. So like, I don't know how you guys tour with with such, you know, fragile gear. Yeah, we've been lucky with the, uh, because we usually tour with a Wurlitzer and yeah. uh, haven't had very many problems with with that but we, we used to have, we have a, a lot, lot of problems, problems we used to really. we used to always break uh you know tines on the whirlitzer and you know that note would just be gone for the next for the <laughs> rest of the shows our main thing <laughs> didn't really was... matter at that point because we had a bigger band and we had like two two guitars and keyboard yeah. but now and nowadays it's just, we've been lucky with the whirlitzer or whatever our main thing now is trying to pare down and figure out what the smallest lightest gear mm-hmm. that we, gear that we can use would be which without you know, compromising, uh, having cool vintage stuff. I always liked when I was playing more drums in the band, I always liked vintage hardware because it's so light. Mm-hmm. And playing, uh, and our drummer now who's really into, uh, old stuff and he, he, you know, he's like us with that stuff, but he doesn't like the old hardware because it's, 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 uh, floppy and, you know, it can, and he's a little bit more intense than I am with the, um, but uh, I always like, I just like uh, old stuff. I don't, the reason that we use that stuff is because it's bought for recording. And I just always thought it looked cooler to bring that out. I mean, of- it does. Yeah. I mean, if, if you walk out with a cool Dan Electro or even like some sort of Vox teardrop, whatever, like they look sick, but they're, man, they're hard to keep the intonation and stuff. correct. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's tough. You get why some people just like play with a Strat or a Tele, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just, uh, it's tough to, to get that sound. But the worst thing you ever would be is like a friend of mine was in a band. I don't, I won't name his band because he listens to this. And they, they got a Rhodes like set and they took it all apart and then they dropped a Nord in there. Yeah. And so it looks like, it looks like a Rhodes, but it's not, yeah. it's a Nord. And yeah. they're like, yeah, we, we just do this because it, you know, it looks cool and they, yeah. they don't have to deal with it. And so I was like, I guess that works, but you know. It makes sense. But the thing for me is not, it would be that, okay, now I have this extra fucking thing with, that I have to bring out of the car every fucking time. <laughs> Extra thing. And then I also have the Nord. It defeats the purpose for me. For me, it's like, just, I wish we just didn't have to use the keyboard, but we have to use the keyboard because some of the songs good with keyboard. I don't like, we have a 12 string. We have a six the string. The Rickenbacker 12 string too, right? Or yeah, am we, I wrong? Well, well, Brian was using a Gibson 12 string on that program, but but it was, we have a 12 string, a six string, a six string, and, a, and an acoustic nylon string that Brian brings Jeez. so that he can play play live and i find that all that to be a pain in the ass because it's so much extra shit but there's not really any way to get around it It really fucks up the set if you don't have the cool stuff you know you gotta get a tech i guess that sucks that costs money we like we like the 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 group that we're with is like super oh yeah they're great and it's fun it's fun to have sort of a small yeah honestly small group a little bit more of an intimate uh we did open the car in our when we first got started we you know toured like we were like a huge band so we we would tour with like a lighting person and like a sound person that was only like one one tour yeah yeah but uh that whole experience is just sucks It, it i don't know like on a bus you know it's like it's not as fun no, it's like you're you're like on a bus, you know. Are you, know? you guys what in like a sprinter now or? Yeah, a van. Yeah. yeah, but it's like it doesn't feel like you're going to all these places, you know. It just feels like you're like in a tube, um, fucking and anywhere just rolling along, dude. <laughs> <laughs> What's the thing you always say? Uh, we're just a couple of uh, troubadours. <laughs> <laughs> You know, know, fucking true. Being a man is not is not unlike being a citizen of the world. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, if you 
if you get in that situation and you're playing and, and you're in one of those like dashboard confessional buses or you turn into one of those bands and you have like six or seven different buses and you don't know what city and what town you're in, it's going to make it hard to keep the cool, cool guy, edgy band, you know, when you're just like, I don't know where the hell I am. And I'm upset that my latte is, you know, not hot enough. Yeah, well, we're edgy. We're super edgy and <laughs> super on the edge, super on the cutting edge of what's new, too. Yeah. And, um, we we're in hate place. lattes. <laughs> uh, before we wrap, I want to talk to you guys about office hours, because I think you get name checked on that pod more than ever. What's what's <laughs> what's your relationship with Tim Heidecker? I didn't know that, but um, well, we played on one of his records um we've seen him live a few times we hang out with him when uh he's in town uh just like at his show yeah, yeah his show. like we have before you know um yeah. Yeah, we're a fan of his and think he's a fan of ours and yeah that's that's we so we met him through through radio from yeah Fox Rado from Fox producing Fox. some of his stuff and who produced our first record and we've always worked with you know on and off for years but um yeah we just like him i watch the podcast uh, uh but i haven't seen that happen for a while probably i think you were name checked on this past week's episode because my wife who is a diehard office, office hours, hours fan is she was like oh my god she's like the lemon twigs get name checked all the time on office hours and i was like really okay i'll go tell him oh, and cool. that's yeah it. you definitely watch that oh yeah so. i'll scrub <laughs> Yeah, you yeah, you gotta scrub or use some sort of AI that like and then it'll you know. get the most replayed because I'll just watch it over and over again. <laughs> Along with the Fallon. Um, what are some of your guys' favorite YouTube videos? As as a you sound like a YouTube uh, expert. Where, like, where do you go? I like the video of um Eric Carmen uh, getting pulled disgraced over actor place. Kevin Spacey <laughs> um uh doing the singing John Lennon's mind games. Um oh, that's oh one of my, my favorite God, videos you have of all time. That. He get delivers some crazy speech before um well it's a, and then he does like a fun little jump as the song starts yes um i mean what I, about the you, what about the other the p townsend one that you posted where this is oh, for the kids p, yeah p townsend on david letterman playing a pinball wizard um on acoustic guitar um and then he smashes his guitar i think with the intention of donating the uh smash guitar to charity but he doesn't really explain that and it's kind of an odd clip he yeah, says he goes, this, this is for all those kids do it for charity and then he just <laughs> smashes his guitar let's do something for the world let's do something good for those kids for charity <laughs> um that's a good clip i'm um, trying to think of really i like really the video of uh, uh the the clip of uh art garfunkel uh radio showed us that years ago uh, art garfunkel um in the studio all the studio chatter of him um what about the great one that making you found the engineers that, life a living hell. then they did on office hours the one that you found oh the oh the video of art garfunkel is a connection Oh, there you go. Was, it was, it was on Bob, Bob Costas. Yes, where what was the kind of punchline of that? It was like I don't know. I posted it on my YouTube channel. Um, oh wait, I mean Lemon Twigs fan Scotty Fillmore. <laughs> Lemon Twigs Scotty Fillmore um, His YouTube posted channel. that. Posted that on YouTube. Um, <laughs> what was the? Um, I'm just well, we're sort of mutual fans. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, what was the clip though what does he do what what is art carfunkel doing that he um, i don't know he's just being himself um oh he he negates himself immediately that was the idea of it oh he, yeah this, bob costas sets up he asks him like what you, yeah what do you say uh to people who say art garfunkel's albums are uh, soft soft saccharine too sweet um he just sort of like insults him to his face kind well, of. No, um really. and he says good uh, interview. he says who are these people who write such things I would, I would say, I would my say, appeal was more to the females, the, the females who like that sort of sultry sound. Um, and furthermore, if I let my defense down for a second, I, I would say they probably have a point. I, I like <laughs> this is completely insane. He Why? has this moment of like a self-reflection where he sees like how defensive he is. And then he just completely has the opposite uh, opinion of, you know, he kind of gives them props, you know, yeah. criticism, which is, yeah. I think, part of what makes him a great artist. Yeah. I don't know about that one. Well, 
Agree to yeah. disagree. You're, you're, there's no <laughs> Art Garfunkel <laughs> fan on this side of the mic. <laughs> Bright Eyes by Art Garfunkel. We have strength in is numbers. A, is a beautiful, beautiful. Really? Solo. So you, you guys are art stands. Okay. Respect. Well, not, not necessarily his I don't solo know. work, but he's a great actor and he is yeah. uh, yeah. a fantastic actor. Uh, and he, uh, Carnal uh, Knowledge and uh, yeah. Catch 24. Yeah. And then the, or, um, what's the, movie that that the was Nicholas really twisted. Twisted. Rogue? yeah uh, 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 uh anyway i can't remember but not as a solo artist although there are great. some songs that are great yeah uh, his contributions to simon and garfunkel are i think you can't deny them. you can't deny them and i don't think it's just his voice i think it, i his really i believe him and, and when he and says and that that he contributed so much because he's so picky and so opinionated uh, opinionated there's yeah. no way that he was keeping his mouth shut in the studio he's probably constantly contributing because he could never not been turn it off yeah tom and no. jerry man that was them yeah you know what's yeah, crazy I, I, recording is great too bad timing yeah. that's this uh road, road yeah. movie like you whenever i like look up artists and i like you know i love to watch old dick cavett videos especially i mean there's there's great stuff with paul simon george harrison and all that stuff in there but you realize that because Paul Simon made so much of his career before Simon and Garfunkel and Tom and Jerry and all that stuff, just writing songs for other people. Dude was like pretty rich and had a pretty wild uh, publishing catalog because he got to keep the majority of all of his publishing. And so like when you think of like artists who, you know, I mean, don't really need to make music, people like him and like Billy Joel, like they just they own all their music more or less. Uh -huh. And so they just were always stacked. And I mean, that's where a lot of legal issues and arguments came from is, is that. And then also Paul Simon was just like so pissed off because they would keep the spotlight on art for Bridge Over Troubled Water. And he was like, that was my song, motherfucker. Like, yeah. but who doesn't? Yeah, but he's, I would, that always struck me as like a story that was, so, that was so petty. It's like the, the story he always tells. Yeah, it's like, I think he's he, I love yeah. it. Uncle would, you know, credit the piano player, Larry ne Nectal, and he wouldn't credit me. Like, and it's like, I know. Can you believe that? It's like, dude, you're rich. You made it. You're yeah. fine. Chill. And let, <laughs> him have, let him have the spotlight. Yeah. Right. Everybody knows your your solo career. Well, I guess, this, would he say that before? He yeah, said yeah, that yeah. that was a contributing factor. Yeah. And taking going solo. Well, once that was done. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes it's just never. I don't enough. think he was underappreciated enough for people. Right. Exactly. So Art Garfunkel lives at the Dakota building and uh, and uh, Paul Simon wanted to move in there at one point. And in order to get accepted in there, you like have to go through the board and everyone has to vet you and all this stuff. It's a pretty, you know, snobby place. Right. And uh, Art was like, no, nah, fam, you're not you're not moving in here. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so there, there, there's a fun, fun story for you of their their vendetta that, you know, never went away. That's not cool. I'm gonna. Be he didn't want to see him. He's like, get the fuck out of my building, man. <laughs> yeah, he's. They're petty, dude. Yeah. They're see, this is why it's good. You guys are brothers. You don't have to deal with this stuff. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> petty. You know, we're petty. Yeah. Uh, every 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 person is fallible. Mm. Uh, I, just, I just think that because our Garfunkel is so with his language is so obviously like I guess kind of douchey. Like you know, he's like yeah, you know, because he's so like flowery in his language and the way that he uh -huh. talks so particular and that he gets a really bad rap. Although we've heard from people, it's horrible. Well, he worked was, with them. Well, but, he also but, sent our our dad a really oh, yeah. letter. If I can say that, I don't think he would care if we told that story. But we that my dad sent him a song and he he a beautiful song by the way, wonderful That's song, yeah, fantastic song. And a, a demo or something or a full recording and like as uh, you know, will, would you do this or be interested in it? And and he wrote back. He took the trouble to write back and wrote thanks, but no thanks. You know, wow. it's, just, it's just terrible. Uh, but but I, all I'm saying is that I don't think he's much worse than Paul Simon. <laughs> we just completely and any there's our heroes you know yeah but i just mean like i don't think he's that much worse but i don't know if i met him maybe he would be hey kill your idols man that's the only way to live i don't want to meet i would like to meet paul simon and not anymore i i would before this interview <laughs> they're, awesome. <laughs> they're honestly they're they're awesome and every but i just mean um you know there's a 
people take apart uh, they dissect uh, these people and stuff and uh yeah we, we, we really, really harsh we dissect, yeah, we dissect all them all the we time. dissect these people and their personalities and pro- in probably completely inaccurate totally ways yeah. all the time but we we even perceive people in normal life definitely in wrong all the time i always think that people intend you know I'm paranoid you know I think did you guys people, ever meet elton john we met him on the um on the facetime on the zoom <laughs> Yeah. And and he was really he was great. Cool. He he gave us a call uh, when our first album came out. Yeah, just not on the air or anything. You know, he was just he just said he likes to take the time to tell people who he likes that they're doing good stuff because he got a nice call from George Harrison when he started. You know, and, oh my god, uh, oh, Brian, this is a pipe dream of mine. But if we ever get to be on the couch, what? I'm going to tell that story. What do you mean? <laughs> like you know, on, on Seth Meyers, on Seth Meyers, yeah. <laughs> Seth Meyers is your dream? That'll oh, happen in a yeah. few few weeks, guys. You'll be fine. But well, well, thanks, guys. It, it was it was great to chat with you and have you on. Uh, congrats on the record. We'll see ya. Thank you. Same here. You've been listening to Blamo. Our show is produced by Blamo Media. We're edited by Amar Lowell and our theme music, as always, by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you like what you heard, you know the drill. Share the pod with a friend. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars or thumbs up on whatever other thing you're listening to us on whether it's dingledorf or bing bong whatever it's called but you can also follow us on instagram for all the hot content if you want to talk to us and give us your hot take we'd love to hear from you you can send us an email at info at blamopod.com last but not least super ultra important if i had a air horn i would press it right now you got to come and join us over on patreon because the fun never stops over there look the the, the live show the, the the free show whatever you want to call this we take breaks here and there but patreon it never stops and we also got exclusive shows like die workwear hosted by Derek guy and peter zatolo and the triple j show hosted by yours truly with uh, john moy and gene Noyan. there's there's just ton of stuff over there so check it out at patreon.com forward slash whammo if not no worries we got hundreds and hundreds of free episodes in the feed and uh, more to come so we will see you all soon 